Good evening. I'm Ariana Cohen Helberstam. I'm the artistic director of Boston Jewish Film. Welcome to the second to last night of our 32nd annual festival. We're so glad you're here with us. Uh, as I mentioned, tomorrow is our closing day, and I hope you will join us for programs tomorrow. We have a conversation about the TV series Unchained, Matir Agunot, at 11.30 a.m., and a conversation with Israeli director Eitan Fox at 1.30 about his film, Sublet. And then at 5 p.m., we are going to be saying goodbye to the festival with cocktails. Uh, we have the cocktail creator from Maccabee Bar joining us to make a special BJFF cocktail. So I hope you will join us for that as well. Uh, we want to thank our partner on tonight's screening, Roxbury International Film Festival, and all of our partners throughout the festival. And now I'm very excited to introduce this incredible panel we have for you here tonight. Our moderator, Robin Washington, who is a journalist, filmmaker, and the co-founder of the Alliance for Black Jews. He is a longtime GBH contributing reporter and producer. He hosts a weekly show on Wisconsin Public Radio and has appeared across many broadcast outlets. He grew up in a Chicago family of Black and Jewish civil rights activists and was participating in sit-ins and protests since he was three years old and is the director of the acclaimed PBS documentary, You Don't Have to Ride Jim Crow. Thank you for joining us, Robin. You are um, we also have the director of tonight's film, Dr. Sherry Rogers, who is a licensed clinical psychologist and whose social activist work encompasses movie production, writing, educational program, curriculum development, and public speaking. She is the president and founder of Spill the Honey, a Michigan-based 501c3 organization committed to promoting human dignity and advancing public knowledge of the Holocaust and civil rights movement. And we will share that link as well in the chat in a bit. Um, and Dr. Susanna Heschel, who is the Eli M. Black Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Jewish Studies Program at Dartmouth College. She is the author of many books and articles and the recipient of four honorary degrees. She has held research grants from the Carnegie Foundation, the Ford Foundation, the Guggenheim Foundation, and more. And Ed Gaskin, who is the founder of Aspen and Stowe LLC, which creates entertainment content for various media platforms. He's an adjunct professor at Gordon Conwell the Theology Seminary. He has recently published an article in the Times of Israel titled, After the Tree of Life Tragedy, I Went to Shabbat and Never Stopped. He currently attends Temple Beth Elohim in Wellesley and Roxbury Presbyterian Church in Roxbury. Thank you all for joining us. Robin, take it away. Thank you again, Ariana. And uh, thank you, Sherry, for making this film. Susanna for appearing in it. And Ed, for all that you do, which we'll get to a little more of this later. I assume most people have seen it who are joining us tonight, but if you haven't, yeah, you definitely should before this is over, and then you should see it again. Ed said he's seen it a couple of times. Actually, I think he said almost four. Um, I have to say, as a filmmaker, uh, it impressed me for all kinds of reasons, but one is just all the footage you found, all the interesting interviews. It's not just the famous people, it's the secondary people, which I thought is something that I specialize in, so it was Great to see that um, uh, reflected um, in your work. So Sherry, I'll just start with this question, simple as one. Um, simple for me to ask, maybe a little bit hard for you to say, why did you make it? Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm always so honored and humbled to be a part of such an amazing panel. And we were chatting a little bit before. And when I was making the idea of making this film, I wasn't thinking about all these discussions afterwards. It really came from an inspiration from my studying Torah. My sister became religious. And even though I had a bat mitzvah, I never really studied Torah um, in terms of um, really understanding how uh, Torah can be a book of instruction, an instruction book on how to really be a better person today. So through that learning. I, um, I, I met a Holocaust survivor in Israel, and I produced a film about him. And he inspired me to create a foundation which uses the arts to promote human dignity. And uh, fast forward, I had met uh, Clarence Jones, who was Dr. King's personal attorney and draft speech writer and legal advisor from 1961 to 1968. 
His name is Clarence Jones at an African-American uh, phenomenal museum in Detroit, the Charles Wright Museum. And he had just written a book, he, uh, a book called What Would uh, Martin Say? And uh, as a Jewish woman in the audience and listening to um, him speak about uh, his book, one of the chapters that struck me among many of the chapters was when he was discussing, um, it was on anti-Semitism. And in particular, he was talking about the Jews in the support of the civil rights movement and how Dr. King had basically told him that if, um, that if, if there was any negative conversation or negative speech about the Jewish people, he would be the one to remind people of the 24 seven commitment that the Jewish people had to the struggle of the civil rights movement. So fast forward, President Obama was president and he invited Clarence um, to the 50th anniversary from the Salmon and Montgomery March. And uh, I don't want to tell, I don't want to speak too much longer, but we started filming in Selma, which I think galvanized the country to really look at civil rights again and the whole Voting Rights Act. And I think that's what sometimes these anniversaries can do is galvanize the community to start thinking about what went into, you know, into those important legislation like the Voting Rights Act. Uh, and um, uh, uh, thank you again for talking about Clarence Jones. He is a definitely a, a hero, lesser known, should be better known, and your film is going to make him better known, uh, figure of the movement. Susanna, your father was very well known uh, for anyone paying attention to the movement. I think in some circles, he's become sort of the Jewish Martin Luther King. Certainly anyone who has paid attention has seen the pictures of them together, uh, as you pointed out to Sherry in Selma, uh, originally, not the anniversary, um, you know, the, the actual uh, march. Um, and um, so, you know, anybody should be able to name him. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, how did this reflect in his personal life? Um, was he, uh, you know, was he the pictures of pain, deep in thoughts, worrying about the struggle? Was your father doing the same thing at home? And, uh, and how would he respond to the idea that he's the Jewish Martin Luther King today? Oh, I've never heard him refer to that way. That's lovely. Um, yes, I would say that what's most striking to me is that political issues in my home were always presented as moral issues. These were ethical challenges that face us. And whether it was civil rights, it was also about the war in Vietnam, which was a racist war, racist both against the Vietnamese, the Cambodians, the Laotians, whom we were bombing indiscriminately, something we never would have done in Europe, of course. And it was a race war because of the way African-American young men were being sucked into this machinery of the army and sent over there to fight. Uh, even as they were <laughs> fighting for freedom for the Vietnamese, they were still facing, of course, unfreedom in this country. So these were the kinds of issues that were dinner table conversation in my home. Poverty was another, by the way, something that my father felt very strongly because when he was nine years old, his father died and his family was very, very impoverished. So he talked about this to me from the time I was as, as young as I can possibly remember, uh, when we took walks together or whether we were sitting at the dinner table. So he felt very passionately, and it was the passion of the prophets that my father brought to all of these political and moral issues. But he also brought a Hasidic compassion and that was also important, not only to scream about injustice, but to feel in your heart for other people. And I think that those qualities were what brought my father and Dr. King together very suddenly when they met in 1963 and they just, they bonded right away and they remained very close and this special kind of friendship. And, and that wasn't uh, just a one-off again, anyone who's paid any attention has seen the pictures in Selma, but um, it's in the film. I don't want to spoil too much. There's a whole bunch of stuff in the film, so it's hard not to spoil as, as I talk about it, but uh, about his birthday party, your father's birthday party 
Ginsburg King was a special guest, a, a speaker. And, you know, uh, tell me, it, it sounds like they had a lot more uh, encounters than just the business of the movement. Yes, they did. Uh, they spoke on the phone often and went together to lecture to Jewish groups and college groups. Um, but oh, I'll just mention one thing. It was in 1968, my father invited Dr. and Mrs. King and their children to join us for the Passover Seder that year. And of course, Dr. King was assassinated just days before Passover. And I, I think it leaves us with um, a question that we might ask ourselves. What would we do at our Passover Seder if Dr. King came? What would we talk about? What interpretations? How would we discuss Passover? And my father felt it was important because the exodus from Egypt was so central to the civil rights movement. And I think for my father also, the civil rights movement gave a special dimension, a special meaning to Passover. And by that, I just want to emphasize, my father gave two speeches that have been published, one called Religion and Race, and one called The White Man on Trial. And he talks about the exodus in both of those speeches, but he talks about Jews, white Jews, as being Pharaoh today. We're not always, as Jews, the people who require liberation. Sometimes we too are the Pharaohs. I think that was an important lesson for my father to convey to us. We need to remember that. I just want to add to that. When I interviewed Rabbi Gendler, who actually was the interviewer at, um, at Rabbi Heschel's 60th birthday, um, he had gathered all the rabbis' um, questions, and then he actually interviewed um, Dr. King and uh, your father. And it was so interesting, but I thought was very important about the question and answer period was the honesty that the questions, even when he asked, you know, about some of the difficulties that um, that happened in terms of the black Jewish relation, Dr. King was very open about it as much as he was so gracious and appreciative of the Jewish support of the civil rights movement. He still said sometimes when blacks and Jews are living close to each other, there's um, store owners that can be difficult. And it can be a problem, but I'm saying what was I appreciated was the um, the closeness of the relationship lent itself to an open dialogue, which I think today we need more than ever is to have proximity and then feel safe enough to have this open dialogue that can lead to a closer relationship. So I, I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, there's uh, actually there's a question from a uh, viewer. Uh, and Ed, I want to get to you, uh, but let's. Uh, this one sort of goes off of what Sherry was just saying. Uh, that it was we just mentioned in passing, the strong connection between the two communities uh, that has been weakened in the past forty years or so. Uh, I'll give a bit of commentary. I noticed that you did not really delve deeply into this in the film, and I think that's perfectly fine as a fellow filmmaker because you can only tell one film. And that's an entirely different one. I am using right now a book to hold up my computer monitor called What Went Wrong by Murray Friedman. Same, yeah, whatever. No offense to Murray. I read it. It's, you know, useful right now. But uh, so very briefly, Sherry, or Susanna, or Ed, actually, um, you know, it, uh, the assignment in the question here is in a minute, <laughs> can you say what went wrong? What about what went right? <laughs> well, that is another way of looking at it, right? Yeah. I think um, from what I discovered was that um, I think at the time um, there was, uh, let's say in New York, there was Jewish teachers who were teaching and the black family said, you know, I wanna see, I wanna see role models and my children should have black teachers. And so therefore there was some struggle with the affirmative action and what, you know, that they wanted their black teachers to be teaching their children. And so some of the Jewish teachers were upset by it. I think after 1967, uh, there was a switch in terms of a lot of the black um, leadership who saw Zionism as a way of empowering black nationalism then changed and basically uh, had more, there was more of a connection and identification with the Palestinian struggle. 
Um, I, I think there were many issues that maybe caused a disconnect, but in the movie, what I attend to primarily is the leadership that Dr. King would speak. He wouldn't have a different speech for whoever he was speaking to. He would, he would see the commonality and he would talk about the Jewish people and talk about the Exodus story and the Old Testament story to empower the civil rights movement. And likewise, uh, Rabbi Heschel would call on many rabbis to show up with their bodies to support uh, the Black civil rights movement, basically um, on Martin Luther King asking him to. So it was, you know, it was that combination of not having that sense of leadership to the degree and then the Black power movement and, and the identification with we can, you know, have our own movement and we don't need to have the coalition like we did before. So it was, it was a combination of, of a lot of things, but I'd like to hear from you, of course, somebody else. Right. Uh, Ed Gaskin's going to the present, but uh, very much to the past, uh, uh, even before all this. Uh, um, your essay uh, says how you um, uh, responded to the tree of, of life tragedy by going to Shabbat services and you haven't stopped. You probably have gone to more Shabbat services than I have in the last few years, so, which is my fault. So, uh, uh, were you aware though of um, African-Americans who are not Jewish uh, having a long tradition of speaking out against anti-Semitism. And I'm referring uh, specifically to the NAACP under Walter White and Roy Wilkins, who uh, in the 30s, and really it goes back to 1910, uh, were speaking out against pogroms, speaking out against Nazi Germany. Um, so, you know, what you did is absolutely great. What you're doing is great. Uh, but I'm just wondering if you are aware of the dual history there. So it's not just Jews concerned about black civil rights, but it's African Americans in the height of Jim Crow concern about injustice to Jews around the world. Well, thank you. Um, so first of all, I have to thank uh, the director, Dr. Sherry Rogers, because um, I thought it was an outstanding film and I appreciated your um, sacrifice and determination and commitment to make such a great documentary. And uh, I think it's gonna be in the pantheon of great documentary classics. So you've contributed to that. And um, I would say that, uh, that you made the movie for a person like me. And this, this has, answers your question, Robin. So I really was totally unfamiliar with the, with the history of the black Jewish relationship. Um, you know, again, I, maybe, maybe in this audience is somewhat embarrassing. So I had some vague notion, or I had heard a rumor that a Jewish person helped Thurgood Marshall. Uh, I had heard maybe sort of kind of that there were some Jews involved in the NAACP, but I didn't know that for a fact. Um, and so, you know, after I saw the movie, um, uh, I, I was much more curious. So when I was watching the movie, I think I saw probably four different scenes with A. Philip Randolph in the movie. and. Um, so then I looked in and researched, you know, what was his relationship with the Jewish community? And I realized that he had won an award for helping um, the U.S. and Israel promoting that relationship. So I looked at A. Philip Randolph, the Niagara Movement, NAACP founding, um, everybody from W.E.B. Du Bois, Dorothy Carmichael. And I, I saw that, that the Jewish community was involved with every one of these people that I just mentioned, which, of course, I had no idea. And I, I said, they're not just allies. I said, they were like totally enmeshed. Like there was, it was almost inseparable when you, when you start to look at the history. And sometimes uh, we'll say something like, we don't need allies, we need accomplices. In other words, we don't just need people to pay the bail. We need people in jail with us. And so when you look at the movie, you're like, oh my God, there's like the Jews sitting right there in the prison, in the jail cell with us. Like they literally were uh, accomplices as well as allies. And I think had I had that relationship, um, I would have obviously felt different about things like the Unite the Right March. When I saw that on TV, I really was sort of somewhat indifferent to it. I didn't really understand the significance of it. I was like, okay, a few people with torches. I don't really, you know, I don't, I was like indifferent to whatever that was or what it, and it didn't mean anything to me. And I remember when the march was in Boston, the, the sort of like the counter march, uh, I was somewhat casual about that because I was like, well, it's an, I know there's a march today. There's nice weather. I don't have anything else scheduled. So I think I'll go because uh, I don't want to be embarrassed by saying I didn't go. 
you know, from a, from a historical perspective. Whereas now understanding the depth of the relationship, you know, I would probably would have been trying to round up people to go with me. And uh, after I saw the movie, I said, I wonder if there's some way to make this like mandatory viewing for any black activist so they don't start saying stupid things that are anti-Semitic um, basically out of ignorance. But uh, that's, that was really, that was really coming from a lack of knowledge. When I, when I went to the Shabbat the first time, I literally just went because I just thought it was so horrific what had happened that the only thing I could know was just to go there, but I didn't, I didn't have the benefit of the history. Great. Uh, we have a, a couple of questions uh, mentioning Yafet Koro and Julius Lester. It looks like uh, somebody, uh, the list of who's Black and Jewish <laughs> has been passed around here. Uh, and that is uh, one question I would have for you, Sherry, um, or, or, well, I'll just say it. Um, you do have uh, Yavila McCoy and Rabbi Capers Fune, who are Black and Jewish and uh, contemporaries today, and you know, very well spoken about what the situation is today and knowing the history. But I didn't see, and I would have hoped to see Charles McDew, uh, who, was, who j we just lost a couple of years ago. He was the second chairman of SNCC and he was Black and Jewish. And as I've been railing for about 30 or 40 years or maybe all my life, uh, black and Jewish are not mutually exclusive. It's great to hear other people say that today. I don't have to say it, uh, but you know, I think that that is that just needs to be hammered home, and not just by me. So, um, you know, were you aware of the, the Charles McDo and not just him? There were other Black Jews who were in the movement. I was three, four, five, six years old, but you know, I was there too. So. So Robin, I welcome you. I'm, I'm hoping to create uh, not only a curriculum with this film, but with the remaining 100 hours and stories um, from each state. I think we need as many coalition partnerships talking about this history. I think there needs to be more knowledge about it. So I welcome you to uh, join our curriculum board in terms of uh, making you know a, a full curriculum to go in schools around the country because I think there's so much rich information about you know all these coalition partners and the important people like you just talked about so um, I, I hope that you can you can contribute as we move forward in educating on this subject. Okay well I will add that to my list too so um, and so all right um, I guess without answering, I mean, I didn't yeah. mean to not answer you. I mean, I definitely, I, de I definitely think at this day and age, I think Black Jews are at the forefront of basically really helping us navigate this whole um, issue in terms of um, racism and in terms of white privilege and how Jews and Blacks can come together. So I, I think that Black Jews are really at the forefront, and 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 I and I welcome relying on our brothers and sisters for helping us move forward. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so Chuck McDo has a book that just is coming out right now. Uh, uh, if you look up Charles McDo, and, and I, I don't have the title um, right now, posthumously. Uh, and so I urge everybody to order that. Somebody's asked the question, where can they get the film too? While we're getting information about ordering. Where we can get the film? Oh, yeah. right, right now it is, um, we're just filming it. Uh, the film is in different states. And if your temple wants to use it or church or uh, they can get it from Menemsha Films, that's our film distributor. So, um, but Susanna, I want to ask, we, we looked at the past a bit, where do we go from here? Where do we go now? Uh, Sherry's pointed out the contributions that Jews of color can have. It's, uh, it, it's a bigger community. There's no question about the alliance, the accomplices, as Ed says, but where do we go? Uh, by the way, there was an election just now you guys may have heard of. <laughs> and so uh, that may help dictate where we're going to go, where we're able to Yes, and isn't it amazing? We have, as vice president, a black woman married to a Jewish man. The <laughs> first <laughs> Jewish second gentleman in the first second gentleman. <laughs> so where do we go? First of all, I have to say it's very important to remember that this is not 
Sherry's business to be a filmmaker. This is her first film, and it's such a great film. That's, I think that's pretty extraordinary. And, and I think it's, uh, as Ed said, you know, this is a history that a lot of people don't know about. And I, I guess for you, Robin, and for me, it, that's surprising. Uh, but I think it's a very important history to know. And so when we want to go forward, it is important to get that push from history, a push from behind to say, yes, now we know this. And it's an inspiration, too. Uh, and in terms of the issues, there are lots of issues. First of all, I think we have to change the way we think because I think we, we've all been hearing cliches about black Jewish relations of the past that don't work, even the expression itself. What do you mean black Jewish is if two different groups and we have black Jews. So, uh, so what's our language? We maybe have to change the words that we use. Uh, but, and it's also true that we have something and look, Forgive me, but as a professor of Jewish studies, I have to talk a little bit professorial, but when I teach, I want to talk more about race and racism and what it means to us in terms of Jewish history. Uh, we, in my classes, we talk about Jewish involvement in the slave trade, a Jewish awareness of the slave trade, a Jewish involvement in the uh, anti-slavery movement as well as support of it. Uh, we, we also have to think about what we can learn for the study of anti-Semitism from studies of racism in the United States. And there's a lot we can learn. I think studies of racism in academic terms are much more sophisticated than studies of anti-Semitism, to be honest. We have something to learn. And that's very important to me, especially now with growing anti-Semitism around the world. So, <laughs> I, I hope that we will see in the next few years also a new slew of books that will change the way we think and the very language that we use that will talk to us about the past, about the future, of what we can learn from each other. You know, even Paul Robeson, I just was, I've been reading in depth about him and I want to add him to the curriculum because his connection and support of the Jews that were being, you know, slaughtered in, in, so, in the Soviet Union and, and his connection to the Yiddish, uh, singing Yiddish Mama. And it, it, there's just so many points of connection that I think we're just, you know, not only discovering, but I think we need to bring them forward to see how as a human family, we are, we're more connected than we're not. We can always focus on the differences, but the more we find our human family connection, I think it makes it easier for us to navigate you know, the world better, especially whether it's business or anywhere. I think finding the points of connection and how we feel that sense of connectivity is very important. You know, I just want to add to that, that I, I think it's great that W.B. Du Bois was in Germany at the turn of the century and saw German anti-Semitism. And he was thinking about it and observing it. And he brought those insights back with him to the United States and applied it to his analysis of racism in the United States. So. You know, there's yet another figure, but I also want to just point out, if you don't mind, one other issue, which is um, I've watched some old videos uh, of interviews with James Baldwin when he was on television or at the National Press Club. And you know, it actually bothers me, it embarrasses me, the way certain people would ask Baldwin, well, why can't you be more like the Jews? And oh, I just, it, it's terrible. It just makes me cringe and upsets me very much. And of course, that's, you know, that's looking back. Uh, and I wonder if people 20 or 30 years from now will look back at our conversations and what they will say. So uh, there are some great alliances that we've had that are very important, but it's also important not to, um, to try to, hit Jews and African-Americans against each other. That's not a good thing to do. And to keep in mind that there, there are also some very big differences. We as Jews, as white Jews, were able to benefit after World War II from certain federal programs for buying, for example, a house at a lower mortgage rate. But if you were black in America, you weren't allowed to live in those neighborhoods. You were stranded. So we've had, certain advantages as Jews when we're white, 
not always, sometimes we also couldn't live in certain neighborhoods. I'm thinking of Shaker Heights, Ohio, for example, restricted neighborhoods where if you're Jewish or black, you couldn't come in. But we have to remember that there are also differences that I, as a Jew, don't have the same kind of fear of the police as an African-American might have, for instance. Uh, I'm not being murdered by the police on the streets of this country. Uh, I can think about what it was like to be a Jew in Nazi Germany. And even if you were a judge, you could, and they were Jewish judges dragged out of the courtroom and beaten uh, on the streets. And so I understand that. And I wanna bring my Jewish history to bear to understand what's going on in the country right now and what racism really means on a human level, how terrible it is, how frightening, how appalling. And I ask myself, as my father asked himself, he always said, what am I doing? What is my government doing in my name? What is my responsibility? Because some are guilty, he said, but all are responsible. So what is my responsibility? And I do live in a city, Boston, which has a pretty bad racist history of the past and of the present. Why do I live in a neighborhood, Newton, which is so white? We're all a bunch of liberals in Newton. So why is it such a white neighborhood? What's going on beneath the surface? Liberalism is also not the answer to racism. It's not that simple. So I think we all have a lot of work to do to explore ourselves, our minds, our hearts, our souls, as my father always said we should do. Before you sell Newton too short though, don't forget it was the one city in America that had a black mayor, a black governor and a black president at the same time. Yes, so, it did. Uh, 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 yeah. We got to work at having that happen again, which is And actually, um, and actually, uh, okay. Professor, I just want to say Professor Hillel Levine, who's been so instrumental in helping so much with this film, he reminded me how there was uh, an amazing conservative rabbi in Boston who really, when there were so many Jewish families who didn't want to move out and wanted to stay in the city, he had acid thrown in his face. So I'm saying there, there's a strong history there in terms of, of course, redlining and all the terrible things that went on in Boston, but there was also at the same time, many Jewish people that, that did want to stay in the city that were fighting for, you know, for more justice. Right. Uh, Ed, I was going to ask you the, where do we go from here? But somebody, uh, we have a question from our viewers uh, that they would like to hear you talk about the tensions between the Jewish community and Black Lives Matter specifically condemnation of Israel. I'm going to parse that question or correct it a bit. It is the movement for Black Lives that had the Palestinian plank, not Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter is a larger sort of over umbrella. Uh, so we don't need to get exactly into that, except it's important not to misattribute what you're talking about. Um, that said, um, you know, obviously there are tensions. Um, so my question initially was, where do you go from here? But where do you go? Well, what do you say to people when you tell people, well, I can't do it on Friday night because <laughs> I got to go to Shabbat, you know? Well, are you Jewish? No, but uh, so, you know, what are you saying? How are you dealing with it in your life? Well, first of all, um, in, the, in the understanding about the issues of anti-Semitism and racism and the varying degrees, there's two things. One is, for me, the, the unifying factor is, are we focused on justice or not? So, you know, maybe this is too uh, spiritual or too religious, but if you think of that God is holy and that we're really trying to focus on a holy God that covers all aspects of our life, and that's what we're really pursuing. So whether that's um, personal justice in our individual actions or social justice in, a, in having a just society, um, that's what we have in common. And the, you know, skin pigmentation is almost immaterial to that. And that's why part of the reason why I love the Shabbat is because of the, 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 tr the, the discipline of going through the Torah portions on a very systematic basis is that almost you can't avoid covering all the texts that focus on justice. And uh, so that should be like a constant reminder, of, you know, again, that, that we're, that's, that's, that's really a, a central focus there. And of course, obviously the repairing the world 
uh, again, just continues to reiterate that. So that's besides our humanity and being all part of the same uh, planet, the fact that we're really focused on trying to focus on justice. And I know sometimes people will try to look at it in um, relative perspectives, like, well, we're suffering more than you're suffering. So, you know, your suffering isn't nearly as bad. And I just look at that, I think of it, it's, it's like math. You know, you have stuff that's relative and you have stuff that's absolute. And for me, the issue of justice is absolute. It's either right or it's wrong. And it doesn't matter the degree of wrongness or the relative of wrongness, it's just wrong. Um, so on the question on uh, the Black Lives Matter, I think I was a little bit thrown at first when I, when I had heard about it because I was more in the school of thought that it was a hashtag or a yard sign or something like that. So I didn't appreciate the significance. And um, I had members hearing somebody say, oh, that they heard sir, there was something in the Black Lives Matter uh, platform that they didn't like, um, that was anti-Semitic. I didn't even know there was a platform. I didn't even know there was an organization. Um, so from where I was coming from, I'm looking at, you know, the, um, you know, Colin Kaepernick and, and a protest of police brutality and officer involved shootings and things like that. And I'm thinking that's what we're talking about, not understanding that there's some other larger um, discussion or context that's going on and think terms I never heard about, um, boycott, sanction, <laughs> divest. I'm like, what, what, I don't, I, what is all this? It's sort of like I'd been sucked into a vortex of this theoretical discussion that, that all I knew was that Black Lives Matter and that's what we were focused on. Um, so when you ask about where do we go from here, clearly, uh, again, going back to the film, I think the disadvantage is, is that people like myself don't know that history already exists and that we don't have to start a partnership. We're already building on something that, that already exists. The disadvantage is, is that I don't know how many conversations or discussions I've been in where uh, people talk about the Blacks and the Browns working together, Blacks and Hispanics. I've never been in a discussion, and at least I know in the last several years, where he said Blacks and Jews need to work together. So I, I wrote in my notes, I said, are, uh, are Hispanics or Latinx the new Jews? Because that's the partnership that I know about. I don't know about a Black-Jewish partnership. Um, and I think in my own life, again, there are situations that had I known that that there was this history, I might have reached out, but it just shows the lack of it, people in my network or relationships that I had that I wouldn't have even known uh, to, to reach out to them. So I, did, I didn't even know that exists. Um, so for me, it just, the, the issue on awareness, again, I, I talk about the movie, that that's a key role that things like that could play to help us understand that there is an existing relationship, platform, partnership, coalition, whatever you want to use that we can build upon going forward. And because the lack of that education or knowledge is what leads to the, the misinformation, the misunderstanding, as is talked about in the movie, and, um, and, and the disintegration of something that's obviously very useful for people who have common cause. Right. And I think, um, in the, I think in the movie, if you were to see there, I just touch upon it briefly, but um, in, in St. Louis, when Michael Brown was murdered, um, Rabbi Susan Tull, um, her, her temple was, in, it's always been in the city. So prior to Michael Brown being murdered, her congregation would actually take care of black graveyards as part of their congregation. She has many black Jews in her congregation. So she makes sure the books have uh, of Jews of color in, in, her, um, in her books, in, in her mosaics, in her temple. And so when Michael Brown was murdered and all the protests were going on, she was right out there with her congregation. And at that time, some of the um, police situation was being reinterpreted as as something somehow that Israelis were training these police, these police force or something like that. And, and therefore there was, there was people were trying to say it was from, you know, Ferguson to Palestine. And then at some point, um, her life was threatened. They didn't want her to be involved in some of the other Jewish participants to being involved in this, in this protest against something that they felt very personal, like, my God, this is someone's child. Like we want to be there for Michael Brown and for other mothers who this is a symbol, if you will, of, of black children being murdered um, at times 
uh, by police officers. And the whole story with that is, you know, what it came out to be is a different story. But the point is, is that she was there and be, had a, developed a very close relationship with Reverend Tracy Blackman. And when her life was threatened, uh, when the rabbi's life was threatened, and then there was a whole black uh, meeting about pulling together to discuss this issue, nobody wanted the rabbi to speak. And, and Reverend uh, Blackman said, if she doesn't speak, I'm not speaking. And it's just a beautiful story because, you know, if there are differences at times within a relationship, the message is you've got to stay in it. We're here in America and there's enough here together that we have to end racism and we need to stand together that we can at times might have different, you know, perceptions or different uh, issues about something else, but it's important that we stay together and, and care about one another here. And that you don't always, sometimes there'll be outliers and you don't, you know, everybody, it's, it isn't a monolith, meaning there's plenty of people that can stand and support, you know, what you're doing here. So that's good. Right. We have a, a couple of questions. It is a film festival uh, about the structure of the film. Uh, one uh, uh, notes that there are many iconic figures and folks behind the scenes. Uh, how did you come to structure the film the way you did? And uh, another one says, um, um, well, uh, another version of the same question. So, um, and I noticed earlier that I think I mentioned earlier that you have some of the major figures, but you have the behind the scenes figures. That's always a filmmaker's dilemma, right? Who do you concentrate on? Because the human mind can only take in so much. So, um, you know, how did you approach all the subject matter and the structures? Yeah, I mean, I thank God. I mean, it's a collaboration. So I had a lot of help from Irina Angelico from Canada to Sam Pollard to Sam Pollard's son, uh, who was our editor, Jason Pollard, uh, from our Jewish editor, Stuart uh, Levin from Michigan, Shevin from Michigan. So um, you know, it was a collaborative effort where you, we have hundreds of hours and then we figure out how do we want to tell the story. And I think because Selma was so significant as the 50th anniversary from the Selma to Montgomery March, we thought it was very important to bookend it sort of with Selma. Um, and uh, like even Rabbi Berman, um, what is one of the people who's Orthodox that I interviewed, who happened to be another person who was in jail during and in Selma. And he said it, you know, he had some contrition because he said that he felt bad that it took the 50th anniversary from the Selma to Montgomery March for him to start using that as a teaching uh, platform to his own students. So um, I think that um, I, that's why I thought it was very important uh, to sort of bookend the movie with Selma. Um, and I, I think what was really amazing, I just have to add this in, in the beginning you see Lonnie Bunch and I tried to get Lonnie Bunch who raised money and it was his idea to build a new African-American museum. And it took forever to try to, you know, he's responsible for 13 museums. And, and I finally got his interview, but it was after the movie was cut. So they're really, I was just gonna use it for a curriculum. And basically, uh, I mean, there's so many wonderful stories he tells including going to Israel and learning from the Israel museums about how to build the museum in Washington here, which I think most people don't know. And his own past work with Operation Understanding um, and working with blacks and Jews, you know, sort of laid the platform as well for him. But telling, uh, he said, after he was done with the interview, he was, oh, Sherry, I just got to tell you this one story. And he said, this just happened. That's in the beginning of the film, you, you hear the story about his own personal shared legacy story, that it was just unbelievable. And it was actually, I can't take the credit for it, it was Jason Pollard who said, Sherry, you know, we should just put this at the front of the movie before the movie starts. Like we were starting it with Clarence Jones saying, if the lions don't tell their stories, the hunter will get the credit. But he said, I think we should put this right up front. So Jay, I don't get the credit for it, Jason Pollard does. Uh, was there, uh, there must have been something you had uh, 50, 100 hours of uh, footage that you didn't put in that you think maybe you should have or you want to know what to do with it? Does it live on its own? Well, thank God that our, our foundation, the Spill the Honey Foundation, is going to be using the remaining 100 hours to create seven minute video segments that the, uh, there'll be a curriculum to support it because um, we have so much footage 
that I think, I mean, the fact that I spent two days with Reverend C.T. Vivian and, and I'm so honored and Congressman Lewis, who's, who's no longer with us. So to hear, you know, those personal stories. So when Reverend C.T. Vivian, when I asked him, he said, you know, there's so much was so much on my mind. No one ever asked me about the Jewish people. And, you know, and he was going on and on about Rabbi Heschel, but no one ever asked him. So getting these stories, um, I, I think I think people need to hear them. Um, from and, and there was a lot of people that I couldn't include, um, you know, in the in this film as well, because as you know, as a filmmaker, it's you you take a few minutes here and a few minutes there. But I think people need to get to know these important civil rights. Uh, there actually there was a woman um, who was jailed. She was a Jewish woman who was in jail for forty days. Um, I, I mean, I had never heard her story before. It was so amazing and so intense, but I just couldn't fit it in. Um, that sounds biblical there, 40 days of course. Yeah, right, right, right. yeah, I guess so, but yeah. Um, she was, uh, you know, part of the movement that went down to Mississippi, and, and she sat with, um, you know, it, Mrs. Cheney, you know, we hear a lot about, which, which is so amazing, I owe so much credit to David Goodman for letting me in on his personal story and his interview with Maya Angelou, but um, she talks about um, sitting with Mrs. Cheney when her son was murdered. And just that backstory um, was, was quite emotional and touching. There's a uh, question if you considered interviewing E. Philip Randolph's children for the movie. I didn't, but I, 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 what, I what I've discovered is I just opened a little bit. I cracked the door. Right. I mean, I just cracked the door. I mean, Rabbi Fun Funde says that, you know, basically this is a foundational element. There is so much building we need to do. And if I, if I contributed anything, it's laying a little bit of the foundation. And now I welcome everybody to add a building block. <laughs> right. Um, well, I don't expect anybody to have the answer to this, um, <laughs> but uh, what's the most important step that we need to do? I mean, going for what, you know, there's a change in this country. So right now, um, we've had this huge coalition that has created this change. Uh, and then, of course, we have a whole bunch of people who didn't vote for the change. We know that, too. Um, Historically, since we're talking about historic uh, history here, uh, coalitions don't always last and they ebb and flow. And so, you know, what do we need to do to keep together? Um, does that make sense? Not just Blacks and Jews, uh, but really everybody who you know, voted for democracy. Can we go to Susanna? Well, you know, uh, it was Bernice Reagan who said, uh, if you're in coalition only with people who agree with you, that's not a coalition. So one of the problems that we've had for a long time is how to, how to go about talking to people we don't agree with. And I see all the time, people don't want to talk to people they disagree with. Uh, and that is really something that I think Sherry and her film help us understand. In her film, she's showing us a lot of people talking to each other, older generation with younger generation, Jews, African-Americans, black Jews with white Jews. Uh, how do you begin these conversations? And we're really way behind actually in figuring out how to sit down and talk. In the Jewish community, we don't do enough ourselves, religious Jews and secular, Orthodox and reform. Now, what can we do? to talk to one another. I, I tell you, I come from a family where my mother's side of the family is reform and my father's side is Hasidic. But I was raised to love both sides and to bring both sides together. Uh, I feel, I, my father raised me to feel comfortable and happy in all synagogues and all forms of Jewish expression. And I want my children to feel the same way and to see always What's, what's special, what's good in each community and in each person. Uh, I, I think we sometimes have these silos for our lives. We don't talk to each other. We live in such gated communities, physically gated, but also mentally gated. So 
this film is important because it will open conversations. You can't watch a film like this all by yourself and walk away. You watch a film like this with a group of people, all kinds of people, including with strangers and people who are different from yourself. That's what makes this film exciting. And that makes you part of the film. The conversation afterwards is an ongoing adventure. And I'm hoping Sherry will use some of the film footage and she couldn't fit into this film and make some more films. <laughs> you know, um, I, you asked me, Zenona Clayton is so amazing. She talks about how Rabbi Rothschild worked for the first integrated dinner in Atlanta, but she also talks about the message of Dr. King's church message about the strength to love and how he asked her to meet with the head of this Ku Klux Klan for an entire year. And it took an entire year of her meeting in a disciplined way with him for, uh, until he changed his mind and cried at the end. So what a message is that? That Dr. King was, you know, you know, expressing the idea of standing and working and never hating the human being, knowing that everybody has a soul and that, um, you know, even with the worst people when, you know, he might, he might have come up against somebody's speech, but he never came against the, the man or the, or the woman, you know, so I think there's a lot of messages that we can still learn from as we move forward in terms of, you know, working with other people and, and, and having hope. Right. And I'll, I'll, uh, your film is the last word, but I'm going to give the last spoken word to Ed here. Uh, short version of the question I asked Susanna, how do we keep it all together? Well, you know, we, we got a great coalition. We saved democracy. Uh, how do we keep it going? Uh, I, I can't speak to the we part. <laughs> I can only speak to the <laughs> How does it in the visual? There we go. Keep it going. Um, so for myself, for instance, um, like I used to teach, I haven't done it in a while, but I would teach one little section on, um, on the Holocaust. And I did it only to point out the issue of genocide, institutional racism, uh, complicity, and scapegoating. So it could have been any genocide in the world, but that was, that was sort of what I was drawing from it. So, you know, I would teach something like that differently now. Um, I've... Uh, in the past, I've always, I've thought about, you know, do I invite my um, African-American friends to Shabbat? And I remember the first time uh, uh, one of the rabbis asked me about that, I was almost like uh, horrified. Uh, and I was horrified because what I realized is that it's very common in the black church for white people to be there almost every Sunday. They hear, they want to hear black preaching. They want to hear gospel music. They want to they think it's the church of spirit. It's on fire and all that kind of stuff. So literally without fail, there's people there all the time. But I couldn't remember in my history of any uh, Jewish person ever saying, you know, come to Shabbat with me or, you know, you should come and see it. Or uh, if I'd asked my black friends, would they even agree to do such a thing? And so I thought to myself, geez, if I can't even do something that simple, uh, I have got a lot of work to do. All right, well. And I kind of just want to mention in the chat, there have been some questions about Julius Lester. He was a very good friend of mine. I've known, I, I met him first way back in the early 1980s. Right. He was a professor at UMass Amherst. Uh, he was a writer, he was an activist, and he used to lead high holiday services at the synagogue in St. Johnsbury, Vermont. And I used to go there with my husband and our children when they were little, when we used to live up in Hanover near, near Dartmouth. And he was incredible. He had a beautiful voice. He led the davening so beautifully, and he always gave a very inspiring sermon. His books are great. His autobiography is great. His, the history of his life is fascinating. And he was such a lovely, gentle, modest, quiet, sweet, warm, and supportive, good human being. Really great. He had a wonderful soul. So yes, I remember Julius Lester very well, and I loved him a lot. Thank you for mentioning his name. Uh, as did I, by the way, and I will, since this is a film festival, make a plug to not quite a film, but a piece on uh, formerly Say Brother, now Basic Black on WGBH in Boston. We can dig it out of the archives on Julius Lester that I did in 1988, about the same time you were hanging around with him. Uh, it was the first time he was interviewed by a Black Jew. <laughs> so if you want to see him davening, we have it on film. 
That's and uh, we, we can make that available. I see also in the note as we wrap up here, uh, an answer to the question where to find Sherry's film and more of her work uh, is at the Spill the Honey Foundation, uh, www.spillthehoney.com. So uh, I- Can I just say one thing? I, I just sure. wanna, it gives me a heart feeling or um, especially having Dr. Heschel on that at the end of the movie, when I was interviewing Congressman John Lewis, um, he said at the time, you know, we are all living in fear, but he has to imagine if Dr. Martin Luther King were alive and Rabbi Heschel were alive, they would be pulling together for those generations yet unborn. So, you know, just hearing that, it's just so touching because I think, you know, people forget that not only was he a congressman, but he was also a reverend. And I think he understood what the two of them represent and how they can be a model as we're moving forward in terms of building bridges, not just for blacks and Jews, but for everybody. So I just wanted to remind everybody of that. Absolutely. All right. Well, again, it's been an honor to be part of this. Thank you, Cherry. Thank, thank you, you, Susanna. And thank you, Ed. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you, Robin, so much for, for joining us and moderating. I also want to just make sure that everyone hears there's some really beautiful comments coming in, just thanking you for the film, Sherry. So, there's comments saying Kol HaKavod and the documentary is extraordinary and it's a wonderful film. Thank you for your hard work. So I wanted to make sure you got to see those comments as well. And thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sherry Rogers, Susanna Heschel, Ed Gaskin and Robin for this really um, illuminating conversation. We were also glad to share the evening with you. And thank you everyone for being a part of the Boston Jewish Film Festival community. We look forward to seeing you tomorrow for our closing day. Thank you. Thank you so much for all your work in organizing this. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.